Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India In the last class, uh, we had looked at uh, film cooling, right? And we said it was a very inefficient way of uh, cooling, uh, but it is, uh, as I said, it is still preferred because it gives you that uh, redundancy in the uh, design. Now let's look at uh, uh, perhaps the most efficient way of cooling, that is the regenerative cooling. Now, in this method as I earlier said, uh, if you have a liquid rocket motor, There is a coolant jacket okay. and uh, the one of the two liquids is made to come in through this end okay. and uh, it will come out through the injector right and through that end and it will come and get into the rocket motor like this. Now as it moves along it picks up the heat from the uh, hot gases that is here and puts it back in and therefore uh, in a sense this mimics the uh, adiabatic wall that we had made an assumption of okay. So, uh, as I said this is very efficient, but the trouble with this cooling is it is a very very challenging problem simply because I do not have a choice on the coolant type. For example, in most other applications like IC engines and other engines, you are free to choose the type of coolant that you want right and you will choose the best coolant, coolant oils like castor oil and other things. But here I do not have that choice, I have to use one of the two liquids. So, the liquid coolant is fixed and its flow rate is also fixed. That is uh, if the engine has a particular thrust then I can back calculate the mass flow rate and depending on the O by F ratio I know what is the flow rate of fuel and oxidizer. So it cannot exceed that flow rate right. So that is also fixed and uh, due to this the uh, design of such a coolant system is very very difficult. Now there are uh, a few things that are under the control of the designer, they are one is uh, the pressure at which coolant is delivered. Uh, the other thing is this is strictly uh, not true uh, simply because you design the engine 
for certain pressure right you can uh, decide on how much of over that pressure you can give in the coolant chambers okay it is not as strict this thing but still there is some flexibility in this and the other thing that is under the control is uh, diameter or geometry of coolant pipes if you remember uh, while deriving our uh, equations for heat transfer in turbulent flow the diameter of the pipe played a very crucial role okay so that is under the control of the designer and uh, the thickness of the put diameter and thickness is under the control of the uh, designer. So, with this we have to go ahead and design this coolant pipes. Now, there are many options that are available uh, as such for designing this. These are shown in this figure here. Uh, if you look at the first one it is something known as a drilled construction. Uh, if you see the uh, view here, there are a lot of holes that are drilled in the wall okay? and these holes are going right up from here to the head end. Okay? Now, there is one problem with this, as you move from the uh, divergent portion to the throat, the diameter is decreasing. Right. So, if you have x number of holes here, the same x number should be there at the throat, which means that the diameters need to shrink at the throat, which is not very easy to sometimes fabricate. Okay. Or you need to have such a design wherein uh, the size of the holes remains the same, but uh, they are more uh, well spaced as it comes out in this end. Okay. So, that is uh, fabrication is a very a uh, difficult part in this. Uh, then you have something known as a tubular construction. This is a lot better than the earlier one. Here, what you are doing is you have two layers. Okay. One is the chamber, that is the inner layer. On top of it, you have pipes that are braced. Okay. So. Uh, in a sense, you can decide on the type size, uh, pipe size uh, as you go from the uh, divergent portion to the throat and uh, to the head end. Okay. This is under in some sense uh, a lot more controllable than the other one. Uh, and then you will have an outer skin on top of this. The uh, pipes are braced or welded together. So, as to keep them uh, in contact, otherwise you will have uh, development of hot spots in certain regions where uh, there is no uh, liquid coolant. Then the other, uh, this is probably the most uh, best of all the designs that is uh, instead of having pipes, if you have a corrugated sheet, okay, uh, it is something like this, you have sheets that will make the coolant channels. Okay. The sheets are such that uh, you can make the coolant channels based on this uh, itself and then they are uh, braced such that they are in position and then again you have a top uh, covering layer. So, this uh, shape changes also from uh, the divergent portion to the throat, the uh, size shrinks at the throat and then again becomes larger. Uh, this is probably one of the better designs because it offers you uh, ease of fabrication in some sense. Then there is something known as wire wrap which is uh, scarcely used that is you wrap wire around the nozzle itself. So, that uh, the coolant uh, moves along uh, these lines, okay. but the trouble with this is uh, you cannot 
uh, even if you wrap the wires there is going to be some gap between them okay that is going to lead to some kind of hot spot uh, 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 generation there so it is not such a, a good design because uh, you cannot cover the entire region with this kind of an arrangement okay now uh, I would like to draw your attention to uh, something that you have already learnt. You have learnt that heat flux from the gas phase side is maximum at the throat, right. So, you need to ensure that uh, this region is cooled appropriately. Otherwise, uh, there is a lot of heat coming in, and if you do not cool it, you might uh, tend to damage this. And in addition to this, uh, you have learnt that uh, the heat transfer coefficient changes from uh, here to here and again here to here. It is a maxima here and then uh, it uh, goes down on both sides. So, head G is varying, right. The heat transfer coefficient coming or the heat flux coming in from the gas phase is varying. You have to keep that in mind and you have to also know certain things about how coolants behave. We will uh, go through that uh, in a minute. Uh, that is I am sure most of you have done this uh, boiled water sometime or the other right. What do you see when you boil water and then have you ever left uh, the vessel on this towel itself for some time? You know, and forgotten to uh, take uh, switch off the gas or something what happens then yeah what happens to the vessel hmm? it could get burnt right that is the same thing that is going to happen here too if we do not take appropriate care we will see how that happens firstly if you uh, look at uh, the boiling of the liquid there are uh, a few regimes of boiling firstly you have something known as uh, convective uh, boiling that is if you have heating from this side let us say this is the hot gas side. that is you are looking at some region here and uh, there is liquid in the pipe. When you heat it at the beginning uh, you have uh, seen this that uh, uh, this portion uh, becomes hotter and tends to rise up right uh, and therefore it tends to carry the heat from this surface to somewhere inside okay. So, uh, heat is being transported from the wall to the fluid inside fine. This is uh, by convection. So, this is known as uh, convective boiling. Then uh, there is something known as nucleate boiling. that is again you have the hot gas side and the heat flux coming in okay. Uh, as you rightly said after some time bubbles begin to appear at the bottom of the surface. So, locally the liquid uh, boils and uh, the bubbles rise up. And as they rise up, uh, they transport the heat from the wall to the fluid inside and then they collapse okay, because they are becoming cooler. So, therefore, they collapse and again become a liquid. In this way, uh, the heat is being transferred from the wall to the fluid inside. 
this is uh, probably a very efficient way of uh, transferring heat uh, from the surface to the uh, fluid inside. Now there is a third regime of boiling this is known as nucleate boiling. There is a third regime of boiling namely of film boiling. Again you have heat flux from the bottom. So What happens is uh, after some time if you supply the heat uh, beyond this stage right these bubbles uh, tend to get formed more frequently right there are a large number of bubbles and these bubbles tend to coalesce right uh, come together and form uh, something known as a film. So there is a thin film of a uh, vapor that has formed close to the surface. Now we all know this that uh, the heat transfer uh, or the thermal conductivity of vapor is an order of magnitude lesser than the liquid okay. So the heat transferred uh, from the wall to the fluid gets reduced because there is a uh, layer of gas that is there and that uh, in some sense resists the transfer of heat. So in a sense if you keep transferring this heat the wall temperature tends to rise up and this is very very detrimental. Now if you plot uh, this in a graph with uh, q dot double prime as the y axis and uh, T wall uh, liquid as the x axis okay uh, you can see all these three regimes like this firstly you will have uh, convective boiling that is uh, the heat flux uh, rises linearly as the wall temperature that is if you keep on increasing the wall temperature this also uh, rises up linearly beyond some point uh, the rise is very very steep and this is convective this regime is nucleate okay the slope is uh, drastically different here in this regime and uh, if you look at the wall temperatures for this, this will be something like T boiling plus 32 50 degree centigrade okay, uh, very small temperature rise above the boiling point and you will be able to transfer a lot of heat to the fluid okay. But what happens beyond this is what is known as uh, a film boiling and there actually the heat flux drops and uh, it only comes back to this level at something like T B plus 400 to 600 centigrade that is you need to increase the temperature a lot more to get the same kind of heat flux okay. If we do not transfer the heat uh, from this region to the fluid what happens is the temperature of the uh, wall tends to increase and uh, it could reach the temperature wherein uh, remember 
uh, this is also under a lot of stress because of the high pressure inside the chamber. So, it could reach a point wherein it could uh, break. So, you would not want that right. So, you have to ensure that at the throat there is nucleate boil okay, or somewhere in this region just before nucleate boiling. If it goes into this region, it could be very, very detrimental right because there is a lot of heat flux that is coming in and uh, that heat is not being taken out. So, the temperature of the wall keeps on rising. So, and that could break open the uh, motor. So, that is why this is such a challenging problem in heat transfer. So, is there an increase after some problem? See, if you keep on heating, right, it becomes a film. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, viscosity of the uh, gases, viscosity of the gases increases with temperature. Okay, and if you uh, look at Prandtl number, Prandtl number of gases uh, is close to one. Prandtl number indicates the ratio of uh, uh, momentum transfer to heat transfer. Right, so uh, the thermal conductivity also goes the same way. Okay, this is a molecular diffusion phenomena. So the thermal conductivity also keeps on increasing. So it only uh, it has to reach very high temperatures for the thermal conductivity to come to the same level right. Now in addition to this we need to remember that uh, uh, the pressures inside encountered inside the uh, combustion chamber of a rocket motor are very very high right the temperatures are also very high. So, there is something known as critical pressure and critical temperature right. You remember from your thermodynamics uh, uh, studied earlier that uh, if we have a PV diagram for a pure substance right, it will go something like this and this uh, point is called a critical pressure. Now, uh, at the uh, critical pressure and temperature, the there is no distinction that you can make between liquid and gas phase. Both of them coexist. Okay, so uh, because the pressures encountered in the rocket motor are so high, you, we need to be aware of this also, right? So uh, if you look at, uh, as I said earlier. If you look at space shuttle main engine, the combustion chamber pressure is somewhere around 200 bar and somewhere uh, inside the coolant channels it could go beyond 300 bar okay. So, very very high pressures. So, if you have temperatures also in that region then you will probably encounter this region and uh, based on this we can uh, make a map of uh, critical temperature versus critical pressure as shown here. If you plot critical pressure versus critical temperature, this is T critical and let us say this is P critical. Now, uh, you divide the uh, region into four parts right and uh, let us call this P 
in this uh, if the pressures are below critical pressure and the temperature is also below critical temperature uh, there is a distinct liquid and a vapor phase right. So, in this region there is a liquid and vapor this region is uh, supercritical liquid this is supercritical gas this region is uh, gas okay. Now why do we need to uh, in a sense worry about this is simply because if we are wanting to uh, design the system coolant uh, regenerative cooling system what we need to know is uh, the properties of the liquid uh, in a particular uh, temperature and pressure and we need to know whether it is a gas a supercritical liquid or something else in that region right otherwise uh, we might uh, determine properties somewhere else and use it something else then we could be under designing over designing and we could probably get into trouble. So, we need to know which region uh, it is there and uh, in the coolant channel what happens to pressure and temperature as you move along the coolant channel the temperature will increase right uh, and there is a pressure drop because these are very very uh, small channels through which the fluid has to flow at very high flow rates. So, the pressure drop will be there temperature will increase. So, in a sense uh, you will uh, depending on which region you are your curve uh, will have a negative slope right. So, let us look at which are the coolants and uh, what is their uh, you know uh, critical points and uh, if you use them at some pressures how do they move okay. Uh, the last column is uh, the heat transfer coefficient of the liquid to the heat transfer coefficient of a reference liquid. What is used as a reference liquid is uh, kerosene okay. Kerosene is used here as a reference liquid. One of the uh, biggest challenges of using uh, a kerosene lox engine right. Uh, kerosene lox engine is uh, you know uh, to put it differently uh, if you look at uh, the Soyuz craft okay, it has probably more than a thousand missions right thousand missions uh, and uh, this has been used to uh, take uh, people and equipment to the space station. Now why is that being chosen is simply because it uses for most of its uh, this thing a kerosene lock system which is very very cheap among all the propellants uh, this is probably the cheapest. 
Now kerosene locks although it is very cheap one of the trouble with kerosene lock system is that if you use kerosene as a coolant right uh, what happens is there is something known as coking. Uh, kerosene remember is a uh, hydrocarbon right it has hydrogen and carbon at some temperature the carbon tends to uh, get deposited and this might block the coolant channels because these coolant channels are themselves very very fine and uh, that is a very serious problem to overcome in uh, development of these engines okay. So uh, kerosene is chosen as uh, the reference fluid and uh, let us look at uh, some of the propellants firstly the fuels hydrazine or NH4 then uh, the other one is unsymmetric dimethyl hydrazine UDMH okay then kerosene then liquid hydrogen okay among oxidizers we will pick uh, N2O4. Now the critical temperature for hydrazine is around 380 centigrade 380 degree centigrade and uh, the critical pressure is somewhere around 145. So if you are using uh, typically with hydrazine and uh, UDMH you do not go to very very high pressures it is somewhere in the region of uh, uh, 70 to 80 bar in the chamber. So upstream of that uh, could be lower than this critical pressure so the uh, heat transfer regime would be in A that is here okay. So there is a distinct liquid and a vapor phase and uh, as the coolant moves from the nozzle end towards the uh, head end it traces a path like this okay. The coolant velocities are something like thirty meters per second and the HL by uh, HL reference is four that is it is four times effective than kerosene. Then uh, UDMH this is 249 and uh, this comes down to 60 okay. So this could be in either A or B and the velocities would be something like 10 to 30 and this is three times as effective as kerosene uh, kerosene itself will be one the HL by HL reference uh, this is 414 kerosene the critical pressure is very low right it is somewhere around 21 so you will uh, most likely end up above this critical pressure so it is in most cases in this regime and moves uh, in this direction okay. Then uh, LH2 remember liquid hydrogen uh, hydrogen is a gas at ambient conditions and only if you super cool it it will go to liquid state. So the uh, critical temperature is very low minus 240 centigrade and uh, critical pressure is something like 13 atmosphere uh, 
Now this will be sorry in C. Now it could start somewhere here and go into C okay because it is uh, if you look at the critical temperature this is also very low this is also very low right. So uh, you could end up uh, with C and therefore if you notice this is very high because it has changed its uh, state from liquid to a gas so the flow uh, velocities are very very high right and therefore its coolant properties are also very high it is 10 times more effective than kerosene right and uh, in 204 the numbers are something like this 158 this is 100 It will be a gas. Uh, if you look at liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen injectors, uh, the hydrogen is coming in as a gas, uh, which is why we are going to in, uh, have uh, swirl injectors for the, this kind of a system. We will discuss that when we discuss injectors, it will be a gas. Now, uh, it is also important for us to uh, kind of know that what is the properties that are desired of a coolant. Uh, you will have two fluids on board right uh, one an oxidizer one a fuel if you are looking at a bipropellant system which one among them to use as a coolant is the question. Uh, typically the choice is uh, invariably a fuel simply because uh, if you look at its properties uh, what is it that you desire of a coolant. Firstly, its CP should be very high, right? Its specific heat capacity should be very high. That is, uh, if you have a higher CP, let us compare air and water, okay? For the same amount of heat that you pump into both these systems, uh, the CP of uh, water and the density of water is also very high. So, therefore, uh, uh, it is something like uh, CP is 4 times density is 1000 times. So, if you uh, pump in uh, uh, 4000 uh, kilojoules, uh, the water temperature will go up by 1 degree whereas the air temperature will go up much much more right. So, uh, that is something that you need to keep in mind uh, when you look at what kind of uh, coolant to use. CP and thermal conductivity are uh, something that is important. And similarly, you have a table for so you have to choose uh, a liquid that has uh, higher CP and uh, probably higher thermal conductivity and which obviously uh, in most cases happens to be a fuel. Now if we have to look at the analysis of uh, uh, the heat transfer, let us say this is the wall and uh, this is hot gas side. So there is TC. this is hot gas, this is liquid and this here is the wall. Uh, there is heat transfer by convection on this side. Uh, in the wall there is conduction and uh, here again you have convection 
right. So, there are uh, there is one that is T C in the hot gas side and uh, let me call this temperature as T wall gas T wall liquid and let me call this temperature as T L okay. So, what are the temperatures that are known and what are the temperatures that are unknown okay and uh, what are the equations to use. Uh, again uh, this is a series connection right. So, the heat flux is going to be the same. So, you have uh, Q dot double prime must be equal to H g into T c minus T wall g this must be equal to K w by T w is equal to H l T w l minus T l ok. Uh, this uh, we had seen we could write it as H w right. Now, there is a radiative heat transfer also coming in from the gas phase side uh, which could be significant. You could absorb this in this, but you need to be careful in deciding on the Hg. It has to also account for if the radiation part is significant, it also has to account for the radiation part ok, fine. Now, how many unknowns are there? We will know this part. T c we will know what about T wall g we do not know this and uh, T wall l we do not know and T l also we do not know right. So, there are three unknowns ok and we have only two equations. So, how do we solve this? Uh, before we get into that, uh, we have seen how to estimate this part, right? Uh, Hg we know how to get it. We said it's uh, turbulent flow, and therefore uh, we based it on Reynolds number, right? And uh, this part is conduction. If we know the uh, wall property, thermal conductivity of the wall, we can uh, evaluate this. Uh, this part. If you look at this, this is again uh, flow through a channel, but this is a liquid ok. Uh, Prandtl number of the liquid is not uh, something close to 1 that you can strike off ok. So, you need to have Prandtl number also. So, H l would be again the flow is turbulent because uh, this is a confined flow and the uh, transition Reynolds number is somewhere around 2300 right uh, flow through tubes and the tube diameter is a very very small. Although if you look at uh, this here the velocities may not be too large, but the channel diameter is a very very small. So, therefore, the flow would be turbulent. So, we can estimate the uh, H l in this fashion and then uh, solving these two equations uh, we can uh, rewrite uh, expressions for T wall g as
and uh, d wall l also we can get and So, uh, we have got expressions for T wall L and T wall G. Now, we do not know how to take care of the other one, right. If you uh, remember your basic energy transfer uh, fundamentals, this is nothing but a pipe flow, right. You have a pipe flow, right, and there is a coolant jacket. Fine. So, if I consider a very small elemental area d x right, then what I know is uh, let us say this is uh, d l at x, then I will call this d l uh, x plus delta x. So, here you have hot gas and this is uh, liquid ok. Now, uh, there is a certain heat that is being transferred from here to here and you can write the energy balance for that as m dot l c p l d l x plus d x minus T L of x, this must be equal to the heat flux coming in that is Q dot double prime into uh, the D A S is the surface area right that is uh, perimeter into D x fine pi D into D x. So, if you take a very small elemental area and uh, you need to also remember that at the entry to the coolant uh, pipe you know the temperature right. So, you will know the temperature there and uh, that is let me assume that to be this point. If you know this uh, then from this equation right you know at the entry point you can calculate T wall L corresponding to that ok. And if you know T wall L uh, from this you can calculate Q dot double prime and you will know the area. So, you can calculate the heat that is coming in fine you know M dot. So, you know C p. So, the only unknown would be this. So, you can evaluate this. Then if you evaluate this, this becomes the next entry temperature. So, you can go on and uh, uh, proceed in steps from the uh, nozzle end towards that is you need to divide the motor into sections from the nozzle end towards the head end ok and proceed in this direction. Then you will be able to get all the temperatures ok fine this is clear. We will stop here, we will uh, continue in the next class. Thank you.